Hi, Anisha. How are you? Hi, Ali. I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. So good to have you here with us on Pharmacy Entrepreneur TV. Um, we have pharmacists from all over the world here, uh, from UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, and from uh, Egypt, um, Jordan, uh, India, or different parts of the world. So we're very excited to hear from British pharmacists. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody for, for wherever you are watching from. Um, so it's in the morning at UK right now, 9 a.m. And it's 6 p.m. in Australia and Brisbane at the moment. So we're excited to start this conversation with Anisha to learn about her amazing career um, in pharmacy. Um, now, Anisha has been worked in different country in different pharmacy aspects of pharmacy. Um, I'll probably let you to introduce yourself and then tell us all about, you know, where you've been and where you are now and the work you've done. So tell us about your pharmacy journey. Okay, so um, I'll take you back to uh, when my parents moved from the UK to the US. They, they really like traveling and adapting to new environments. So when I was a teenager, I moved out to America, to Virginia, um, went to high school there, and then did my undergraduate degree in biology and chemistry. And I knew I wanted to go into some sort of healthcare related um, profession, but I wasn't really sure what avenue to go down. And initially, I thought I might be a pediatrician. That was something that I was interested in. And uh, the universities in the US, you need to have your MCAT exam done. And I got good scores, but not probably good enough. So um, I would have to take a year out and do the exam again. And at that point, my dad sort of intervened and gave me some advice that, you know, why don't you, instead of taking a year out, try and, you know, go to pharmacy um, and see if that could be an option for you and we talked through you know the benefits of being a pharmacist the variety within the career and how it's expanding him and my mum actually owned a pharmacy for 20 plus years but they're both not pharmacists so uh at that point I I wasn't so happy living in Virginia it wasn't um I didn't feel at home there it was a lovely place I made really good friends but it just didn't feel like home I missed the UK the whole time so I applied um, to come back to the UK in, at some universities um, at home and got into school, went to start a pharmacy and yeah, haven't looked back really. So when I first qualified, um, I decided to do a residency. So the UK residency in Oxford, they're, they're quite different all over the country, but the Oxford one is um, you're, you're uh, in a three year contract. Uh, every three months you rotate to a different specialty within the hospital and this hospital is uh, the, the entire trust is built of four hospitals so in total there's about 1600 patients so it's, it's quite big mm. so there's a lot of variety you have all of the specialties there everything from you know renal transplant trauma mm. medicine all sorts of surgeries um, pediatrics, a huge pediatric center, cardiology, everything. So you would get a really good grounding in clinical pharmacy. So I got into that program, um, three years of on-calls and nights and um, studying for my clinical pharmacy diploma, which is also a three-year course. And um, during that time, I met my husband and he was already living in Dubai. So we did long distance the entire time. I was a resident so I was flying out to Dubai for you know long weekends finishing night shifts at sort of eight in the morning and getting on a bus to the airport directly from work and flying out to Dubai and then catching a night flight on the way back and getting the bus back to work and going straight to work with my suitcase wow. so and I did this I know it, it's just crazy I did all of this uh yeah it was I don't know how I did it or why I did it I, I guess I did it for love and um, yeah. I thoroughly enjoy traveling I love the weather in Dubai um, it was quite a luxury and we created um, what we called the love fund so every <laughs> month we would send um, sort of a hundred pounds each 
uh, it's I guess at the moment it's about 130 US dollars into this account and whoever had to fly would use that money so we didn't have to kind of waste so we yeah we we um, worked it out from an economic perspective uh, to help us yeah see each other so that was quite amazing and during that time I yeah I loved my residency and I did a lot outside of work as well as in work so um, I climbed Kilimanjaro when I was there I did the Annapurna circuit with another pharmacist um, who we both traveled together a lot during that time and I built lifelong friendships because the residency brings you very close together I live with two other residents and we had uh, yeah a really nice sort of three-year journey and the residency itself is a brilliant way to start pharmacy so I do highly recommend it if people are thinking about what avenue to start because you just get such a good grounding in terms of skills and knowledge you get to work with all sorts of different pharmacists different teams you have to adapt to new environments every three months and this is new nurses new doctors new you know ways of working you manage the dispensary, you know, for on calls and you need to work really well with the team. Your communication needs to be, you know, a high priority. Um, you, yeah, you just, you do endless amounts and it's, it's a brilliant way to start. And for me, I was around extremely inspiring people at that time. I felt that some of our senior pharmacy colleagues were so inspiring to be around and, legends in in the pharmacy world and that some of them are still there which is amazing mm. and we had some really good mentors so overall that really gave me a lot of good skill and a lot of good knowledge and I felt sort of unstoppable at that time because I just thought mm. yeah this is amazing and I thought back then that take finding a specialty and finding a specific area of pharmacy to enjoy from a clinical perspective was what I was meant to do or what I was going to do because everyone around me was doing the same and when you're in that hospital environment you kind of get I guess sucked into that pathway which is great I mean it's it's an excellent pathway to go down but obviously love got in my way and um I decided that you know I didn't really want to do long distance we did it for three years and we struggled. So um, I decided to just go out and move to Dubai. Mm. So we, I moved out there thinking, and when I did my research, there's so many hospitals out there. They've got an actual city called Healthcare City, where there's lots of clinics, hospitals, you know, everything healthcare related is sort of in that area of Dubai. And when you look online, you just think, there are endless amounts of jobs and there's no way that with my residency and my clinical diploma and my background having you know a good two undergraduate degrees and a master's like how could I not get a job mm. so um it was very difficult to try and find a job online and my husband had told me that the way that sort of Dubai works is the best way is to get here start networking going to meet people and just getting yourself like your face known. And that's how you kind of network and get to know people. That's how it works in Dubai. It's quite different to the UK where everything is sort of done very formally in a very mm. you know structured process in terms of online applications and then you get your interview, et cetera. So that was a little bit strange for me, but I trusted him and I thought, okay, he knows best. He's been there for several years, so let's wing it. <laughs> and oh, it took me, nearly one year to find a job oh my wow. goodness it was wow. it was yeah it was frustrating mm. and it was really difficult for me because every day after just being what I felt like being a machine and then suddenly stopping and going on to every single you know recruitment website and I was I was literally going door to door with my CV Wow. trying to find yeah literally trying to find people to talk to and get away into the HR department and try and you know I was going to hospitals like turning up at pharmacy departments mm -hmm. because I was just really struggling to find a job mm -hmm. and some of the jobs that I was applying for I think they they didn't even respond maybe they thought I was overqualified and also in terms of how much they pay 
depending on your nationality, you do get different salaries. Mm. So some of the jobs that I was applying for, I think that they had lower expectations in terms of how much they wanted to pay the pharmacist. And they know that if you're from the UK, the US, you know, big countries, that your salary expectations are a lot higher, um, which is quite normal out there. It's not equivalent in terms of this is the job, this is the salary. If you come from a different nationality, you do get paid differently. Um, so that kind of inequality was something I wasn't used to as well. So, yeah, I ended up just saying to my husband, you know, 11 months in, I, I'm, I, I kind of feel like I should go home because I'm losing knowledge and I don't like the idea of not earning money and just kind of, yeah, relaxing. And so I'm going to go home and work part-time um like as a locum pharmacist so you just kind of get paid per hour and the amount of work that you do and get short contracts which is really easy and then keep on coming flying back until something comes up so at least my mind is active and I can earn some money keep my cv going Mm. and then we'll see what happens I booked the flight and of course after I booked the flight someone contacted me (laughs) so (laughs) So I actually went home for a break, but um, I did find a job with National Ambulance, who are the emergency services provider for the entire country, except Dubai as a city. So the United Arab Emirates is um, split into different emirates and Dubai is one of its own. So Dubai had its own emergency services, but the rest of the country was covered by National Ambulance. So when I joined that organization, when you look at the CV, it looks like a very normal, quite standard pharmacist role. But when I physically started on my first day, I knew this is going to be different. Um, on my first day at work, there were medications all over the floor in the office area because we were taking over the Formula One contract. And the previous provider had lots of medications and kind of like I guess we bought them or they passed them on to us Mm. so we were everyone was helping out in the office to organize these medications and what we were going to use and how we were going to use them and that's kind of what I walked into so I had to um, help to set up a medical clinic for patients to come to at the Formula One event. So we we had a medical center. So there were consultants, doctors, um, chiropractors from all over the world who come, they volunteer for Formula One. So they come from all over the world and uh, they work as a team as a just in case situation if drivers um, obviously crash um, during a race, but also we cover the public throughout the events for minor illnesses. So. I helped to set up the pharmacy element of that. So one side of it is setting up a pharmacy so that we can run a clinic. So ensuring we have, you know, medications, everything from sort of mild painkillers to, you know, people are suffering from dehydration in the heat, um, you know, antihistamines, things like that. So we had a a little pharmacy, um, prescription pads for the doctors to use, but then also we had to provide packs for paramedics and doctors to actually carry trackside so that if anything happened to the drivers they could run out to the scene um, use anything and everything from propofol succinothonium fentanyl um, whatever they required at the time of need and a lot of the people hadn't met each other so the first couple of days of us all getting together was how are we going to work together And for me, it was training the doctors on how to use the medications um, and what the legal requirements are because they've come from England, US, New Zealand, all their normal laws are completely different. Mm. So in um, the UAE, if you use any control drugs, you need to keep the empty vial and then in order to get a further supply of morphine for example you need to return that vial the batch number and expiry date needs to be linked with the sort of prescription Mm. and when you get your resupply um, from the control drug center you take those prescriptions and empty vials and they they literally are checking each prescription and each vial in order to give you a new supply which is obviously very different to what i'm used to in the uk So the control drugs registers and how we record everything is quite similar, but the supply chain is completely different. So obviously I had to be very careful and 
be very clear and provide good communication to the doctors that don't lose the vials, whatever you do, mm. because their rules there are so strict that they, whoever the narcotics officer is, so whoever's in charge of the control drugs, um, there would be legal implications for lost vials or broken vials, etc. So it was, a, a, in some ways, it felt really risky and it's completely different to what I was used to. So I had to really communicate really well and it all worked out fine. We did have a couple of broken vials in my time there. And um, I joke and say that, you know, I told people in the office that, you know, I'm going to let them know that this is broken. If I don't come back in two hours, you know, I might be in jail, come and get me. Um, so yeah, that was a joke in our office. So, um, but there are legal implications if things do happen and you really do have to explain yourself and do mm. all sorts of audit trails as to why vials got broken inside a, a pack and maybe the security of that pack needs to change. And we looked at um, kind of sourcing better drug packs with more padding so that the, the vials don't get broken. But if you're in an ambulance and you're rushing around, uh, these mistakes can happen. There's nothing you can really do about that. But wow. um, yeah, so it's different. So that was my first few weeks. And in that job, the company grew at a very fast rate. So the services we provided was, yeah, it, it grew so quickly. It felt like we went from sort of 20 ambulances to 100, 150 in it, what felt like a year. So providing medications and procuring medications and doing import permits from all over the, um, all over the world to get the drugs here, like even adrenaline. Sometimes I used to wait six to nine months for a delivery. And sometimes it would get stuck at the airport because the import permit didn't go through or there were some issues with other people trying to also import. So if theirs hadn't been released, yours wouldn't be released at the same time. So we had a lot of issues with procurement and getting medications, which meant that I had to order in such bulk supply and try and get as long expiry dates as possible to ensure that my stock survived. And also when I started this organization, paramedics were not able to use medication. So one of the first things that um, the medical director had to do with me was to liaise with the government to change law and change policy for the country that actually, you know what, paramedics should be administering medications and they should be allowed to save lives and not just transfer a patient from a home or an accident to a hospital they should be able to treat the patient effectively. So we, we, the medical director and I worked together with the government to help to get that change. And so we created a formulary. Uh, we used, you know, very specific indications, very specific doses, and the paramedics and technicians couldn't go outside of that. Um, and there were certain drugs like control drugs where they would have to call the medical director um, he, whatever time of day he was on call 24 hours a day every day of the year if they needed to use morphine in the middle of the night they needed to just call him and get approval um, ver like verbal approval and then afterwards they would sort of write prescriptions and return the empty vial and then I would get a resupply but bear in mind that some of these ambulances and helicopters were based maybe 300 kilometers away so I would expect a paramedic after using morphine to drive 300 kilometers to deliver me that vial so that I could get a resupply. Yeah, it's, it, it sounds so crazy. And all of this was done on paper. Oh. So we had no electronic prescribing, wow. no electronic systems to record, you know, what I, I had, you know, say 300 to 400, um, basic life support and advanced life support drug kits. And when I would deliver a kit, they were all numbered, but when I would deliver it with the expiry dates and the quantity that I've provided, I would have to record that on paper or on my computer mm. on an Excel sheet. And then it would get delivered to that station. They would use it. And then when they reached a specific par level that I set in the bag, they would then return it back to pharmacy and then contact me for resupplies. And to get a resupply, if they're 400 kilometers away, would take two to three days at least. And our supply chain team would 
have to help me with the deliveries because I couldn't Mm. deliver all over the country. Mm. So when they delivered their consumable products, they would help me to deliver uh, medication. So I worked really closely with our procurement team and they were amazing. The guys who did my deliveries were just, they were brilliant. They worked really hard and, Mm. you know, they tried to follow all the procedures and Remember also, you've got all these ambulance stations, you have to make sure that all the storage requirements are met from a legal perspective, whether it's control drugs or not, you have to do audits on, you know, temperature monitoring, because you're, some of them are in the desert. And if it's 50 degrees, you've got to make sure there's appropriate air conditioning in place so that the drugs are stored at the right temperature, you know, the storage requirements fit the, the legal requirements for the country for the health authority. So doing all of that I, it, it was just me there was there I had no wow. staff yeah so it was yeah it was a crazy job and I and I loved it I really enjoyed it and um, I learned so much from a leadership perspective and going from a very sort of basic you know newly qualified pharmacist role into that mm. was a huge learning curve but an amazing learning curve and and you know, my medical director um, was my mentor and I I'll appreciate every single day that he gave me advice. And we did a lot of um, sort of major incident planning, contingency planning and writing, you know, all of our processes so that if he always used to say, if I got run over by a bus, then <laughs> he could do the job for me. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, we also did, we ended up going electronic. So that was a big project and we had a project management team and me so we used a system called operative iq so that monitored my inventory where my bags were going expiry date monitoring if the paramedics were using it i could see the levels going down on the system so then i could actually predict when i needed to send more bags when they needed to send bags to me you know if i knew a mass supply of adrenaline was going to expire i could send an alert to all the paramedics that these are the bags that contain these drugs with you know an expiry date within one month mm. um please send them back to pharmacy and i'll give you a resupply and then i try and send those drugs to an area which they had high turnover of that product and then utilize the medications elsewhere um so they didn't get wasted and we didn't waste money so all of that was yeah done on my yeah, own that, which was that's amazing challenge. yeah it just just showed that her pharmacist's job are not just putting the label on the box. Pharmacist's I know. job scope is so much, so broad, not only clinical that you've went through that rheumatology, cardiology, rehabilitation, trauma units with ambulance and you know, infectious disease, all these clinical knowledge you have, as well as manage the medication, the stock control, making sure the temperature, making sure control medication you know, count all of them, even have to send back the mm. empty vial, all that um, is making sure the safe delivery of the medication, uh, as well as writing the procedures, making sure there's no, um, you know, potential error or risk, which can cause yeah. harm. So again, has been highlighted again, again, that pharmacist job and scope of practice is so much more than, um you know, we, we think just putting that label on the box. Yeah, it is. It is quite amazing. I mean, I went from a very clinical job to effectively an operational governance med safety person yeah, and procurement manager and dispenser and problem solver. So yeah, there was a lot involved, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And there was a lot of variety in that job. And this is where I started my education um, experience because as we grew as a company, obviously, we were hiring paramedics from all over the world. So this is where, you know, I thought, you know what, we need to train these people once they come in. And in their first week, they're with us in the office for all of their induction and education bits and bobs. So this is a perfect opportunity for me to get a slot in that area and give them an hour of what are the rules? What are the drugs you can use? How are you going to get your deliveries? What paperwork do you need to um, record when you've used medications? You know, how to contact me, you know, all of that information, plus a a crash course on controlled drugs and all the regulations around that. So I slotted into their induction and that made it so much easier for me because it wasn't a a case of having to re-explain it or expecting them to just read our standard operating procedure or our policy on um, the intranet. 
We also did um, a few e-learning courses, which they had to do as um, like their mandatory induction. So they had to do certain things online within the first like month or so of starting the company, which helped to, again, reinforce some of the information that I wanted them to understand. So that really helped. And that kind of, yeah, demonstrated my joy of teaching. And I did that um, for two years. But and I love that job. But I the whole time I was there, all I could think about was I miss patients. Mm -hmm. I miss interacting with patients. I miss counseling. I miss empowering patients to understand their medications and side effects and make better decisions in, term of, in terms of medicines optimization. All of that was a, a huge thing that I loved as a pharmacist when I was a resident. I love discharge counseling and educating. So going from that to a very operational role, I just kept thinking, oh, you know, I miss it and is this for me, you know? So I applied to Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, which is, they're an American hospital that have branched out internationally and they were opening up in Abu Dhabi and um, a friend of mine started working there. So she kind of helped me out to get an introduction with the um, director of the pharmacy department. And um, yeah, I got a job there, which was great. So I was working directly with patients um, in a very busy sort of outpatient pharmacy within the hospital. I mean, sometimes we would have about 100 people waiting what? for prescriptions at one time. It was a huge pharmacy. We had like 10 stations or 10 counters where a pharmacist would literally sit the whole day, just ticket after ticket after ticket, just, mm. you know, providing medications. And there I learned so much about medical insurance because, mm. um, it's all private medical insurance in the UAE. Um, so depending on how good or bad your insurance is, you know, provides you with different types of medication. So sometimes things are covered, sometimes they aren't. And the system where you get your insurance approvals done, the link between the hospital and that system and that organization was sometimes a little bit slow. So we would have patients obviously coming into the pharmacy, we'd start preparing their medication and then we'd sit and wait for approvals or we'd have to call their sort of hotline and be like, can you please try to approve this medication? And the doctors obviously have to write very specific codes to, in to get that medication approved. So if you've got paracetamol, you can't put hypertension as the diagnosis, it needs to be headache or pain um, for it to be approved. So if they make a mistake with their diagnosis codes obviously the medication gets rejected and then you have to go back to the doctor ask them to change it and then resubmit it through the system so sometimes this caused quite a bit of delay which um, was frustrating from our end because we're trying to work on very specific sort of kpis and targets in terms of um, getting patients through the pharmacy but also the you know the patients get frustrated having to wait and they don't understand the process so we were constantly battling sort of patient wait times, you know, educating patients and dealing with insurance. But that team of people that I work with, were they were lovely. It was a huge team, but lovely people. I met people from all over the world in that job and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, but during that time, um, I got pregnant. So <laughs> um, I worked throughout my maternity and then I decided to come back to the UK to give birth and then go back to work and maternity leave there is six weeks uh that's the standard sort of um government regulation so I knew that I had to be prepared for that mm -hmm. and um I took I guess I saved up all my um annual leave to be able to fly home because obviously there's restrictions on how pregnant you can be and when you can mm -hmm. fly so I spent four weeks prior to giving birth um at home with my family which was really nice um spent some time with my parents and then flew back after um six weeks back to um Abu Dhabi to uh work and my daughter went straight to um full-time nursery and um was yeah it yeah it was it was a challenge a different a different type of challenge and I guess I didn't know what it was going to be like or how difficult it was going to be but somehow I made it through I, um and I did night shifts, day shifts, weekends, and somehow, yeah, I coped. I have a very supportive husband who helped me a lot. So that was very useful. 
and um, but then when you become a parent your priorities change so at that point we did feel quite alone because I was working so much you know trying to juggle you know a work-life balance um, I felt some element of guilt that Liliana had to go to nursery full time and I felt mm -hmm. bad that I wasn't I wasn't able to be at home with her so yeah and I didn't get enough fulfillment from my job um for a variety of reasons and I just thought overall I don't feel 100% happy I think also part of that was I did go through some element of postnatal depression as well and I found being a parent was it was really hard for me and I, I didn't think that was going to happen to me and I, I didn't prepare for it or plan what would happen if I experienced those feelings so I just at that time I just felt like the only thing that will make me happy right now is to go home and mm -hmm. be with my family and my husband supported that and then we decided to kind of move back to the UK. Wow. So it's, yeah, just very pharmacists are human too. We I know. We have family, we have feelings, we we get really tired, we're overwork and we're burnt out and we need to look after our own two children. And so yeah, I think it's it's great that to to hear your journey. Um you know, also having kids and also work in a really busy clinic and Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic is, is massive. So it's great to hear that journey. And I know that you show a lot in your podcast um, as well. And then the fact your husband is there first episode with you. Yeah. <laughs> journey, which is amazing. I think I really encourage everybody to go and listen to that podcast. And so tell us, how did you start the, the podcast and why did you start? So when I came back to the UK, I, I didn't exactly know what job to go for. And I knew I've spent quite a few years in, in the UAE where I didn't utilize my clinical knowledge. And that was something that I love in terms of pharmacy. And the role in, in the UAE is, and the role of the pharmacist is quite different to the UK. And I feel that obviously the UK has been around for so much longer that the, the jobs are more experienced and you get to utilize a lot of your skills and knowledge in comparison. But things are moving in the right direction. It's just as at a slightly slower pace in Abu Dhabi, but things are moving in the right direction. And the pharmacists working at Cleveland Clinic and now, yeah, they're doing an excellent job with sort of clinical services and pharmacotherapy and they're following a lot of the US systems in that way, which is wonderful. So um, I came home and I decided to, I applied for an education based role, looking after trainee pharmacists. And then um, the other part of the week, so I worked full time, but three days a week I did education and two days a week, I sort of went back to Oxford and locum for a few months, worked in emergency admissions to sort of uh, rebuild my knowledge and my confidence. And for me, Oxford's home, so it was easy. I felt so comfortable after five years of working there just of working in the UAE to come home and go to Oxford. I met old friends, doctors that I used to work with from like five years prior on the wards, which was just lovely. And it just felt like automatically, we just like running up to each other, hugging each other, like, what are you doing here? And you know, it's just crazy. They're like, you're supposed to be in Dubai. Like, what are you doing with your work badge on and like working here? So that was, that was quite incredible. So at that time, so that was about two years ago now. And my education role really highlighted for me that things have changed in the UK since I've left. And I guess um, students and sort of newly qualified pharmacists have a different mentality to mm. maybe when I first qualified. And when I was working with trainee pharmacists, I felt like I really needed to sort of push them and help them a lot more with time management, organization, you know, getting tasks done, prioritizing. And I thought that, you know, when, when I was a trainee, it didn't feel like I needed that much support from that perspective and nor did my colleagues or friends. So I started thinking, you know, what's changed? And, you know, what can I do to help? So during COVID, um, I, I've still been working. I'm now working as a specialist um, pediatric pharmacist and also a lecturer at a university. 
and teaching university students, yeah, reinforced how younger pharmacists are different to me and I'm not even old. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to find a way to really help them to kind of to grow and to understand what pharmacy is and obviously coming back after five years we've now got roles in sort of um, general practice pharmacists working with doctors and um, gp clinics we've got pharmacists working in what we call our primary care network so they're working in terms of um, like finances and you know local commissioning groups so the role has completely expanded and newly qualified pharmacists I feel like they don't really know what avenue to go down mm. and I think it is really hard you know when when I qualified it was sort of like yes community pharmacy your high street pharmacy hospital pharmacy or the industry now there's at least you know six seven eight nine options and it's difficult to understand your skill set and know where those skills will be suited as well as fo following your passions so for me I just thought you know younger people love social media and I've not really used social media for about three years. So how could I help them to educate them, to inspire them, just to help them learn what's going out, going on in UK pharmacy as well as internationally. So just randomly one day on the train on the way home, I was just like, well, like, why don't I just start a podcast? Mm -hmm. You know, this is easy for me to do is just interview people, real people working in real jobs all over the world and talking about how they have reached where they are today is the perfect way for people to learn about what pharmacy, what we do in pharmacy and to showcase our profession. I feel like we just don't do that enough. Mm. And I've realized in, during this time in COVID that I'm, I'm starting to realize where I fit in in pharmacy. And this whole 10 years I've been qualified. I like what I do when I'm doing it, but I still, I, I haven't sort of said to myself, like, this is it. Like, this is the job I want. This is where I'm going to stay. You know, I want to work here for the next 25 years. I haven't found that. And it's something that I feel like I'm looking for, but I'm also starting to learn that maybe that's, you don't need that, that you can chop and change and go to different jobs. And that's the enjoyment of pharmacy is that you can have a variety of roles and do have a hand in lots of different things. So I set up the podcast and I just thought, let me just get my husband to interview me so people know who I am and then start interviewing other people. And originally I aimed this for students because I'm a lecturer. So originally I was like, look, it's for my students, you know, to help them understand what career pathways to go down early on in their pharmacy course. So they understand more about themselves. So if they start hearing stories from other pharmacists and they think, oh, you know what, that's a bit like me. Maybe I would be suited to work in a community pharmacy because I like that direct patient contact. Or maybe my clinical knowledge is excellent. And so hospital pharmacy might be for me. So I was trying to get them to understand who they are, but it's expanded into all pharmacists and anyone and everyone, whether you're a pharmacy student, whether you're newly qualified, whether you're 40 years experience is listening to the podcast. And from that, I mean, it's only been two weeks and I, I feel like I'm coming up with sort of endless ideas to expand this, I guess we can call it my, like a company or, you know, yeah, I, I, yeah, it feels very strange because it's all very new, but the feedback I'm getting is, is amazing. And, you know, I'm connecting with people all over the world, like you. My first day of putting out the podcast, you contacted me and it was like a legendary moment. My first email <laughs> came through my inbox, you know, Ali, I was like, yes, let's definitely, you know, collaborate on Facebook and share stories. And, you know, um, I think I've, I think maybe found my passion and I think maybe this is where I fit in in the pharmacy career is showcasing what we do and really highlighting what people are doing out there and inspiring other people to do the same yeah definitely for pharmacists need to have a voice and help the general public understand what we do and why are we doing all these things and um, yeah, definitely all these uh, stories from pharmacists from all over the world, um, not only helping the general public to understand what we do, um, our stories, but also help other pharmacists, pharmacy students to 
um, broaden that horizon, understand there are opportunities out there we can venture out to um, mm. even from different country and borrow ideas or bounce ideas from each other's experiences. And so I think that's a great, uh, that's where our global pharmacy community is trying to achieve is to, to bring and connect your pharmacists from all over the world and start the conversation and share their stories like yours and, and showcase each other's work and help each other yeah. um like um in your case where where can everybody find you to listen to your podcast so the podcast is on um, most podcast platforms whether it's apple Podcasts, google spotify anchor so you can just type in pharmacist diaries and you will find me there i'm also on instagram at pharmacist diaries uk and also on twitter as well which is farm diaries uk that's great. So, yeah. <laughs> Any um, advice for our pharmacy students or aspiring pharmacists? Yeah, I think while you are a student, you have a lot more time than when you start working and balancing that sort of home um, work or work-life balance. So during this time, I would really highly encourage you to figure out who you are. And what I mean by that is really understand where your skills are, what your passions are, what you thoroughly enjoy within the pharmacy course and try to see where you could fit that into a job. Because I truly believe now, I'm starting to realize it, that this podcast was sort of a passion project and I haven't felt this type of passion before. And now that I feel it, it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like fun. And for me to just feel fun when it comes to pharmacy means that I obviously genuinely really love it. So if students can figure out what they really, really love about pharmacy at an early stage, then they'll be able to follow their passions and their, you know, things that they thoroughly enjoy from an early stage and, and, and really enjoy their work. And I also think that one of the wonderful things about pharmacy is that you can get involved with so many different aspects whether it's education hospital industry community and try lots of different things learn who you are along the way and don't be afraid to yeah try something new or go out your comfort zone because that's what I've been doing and it's led to a lot of good things mm, yeah well thank you so much for sharing welcome, with us your journey and we can't wait to continue listen to the podcast um, so we'll put the link um, down below in the comment below. And if you have yep. any questions, um, please start the conversation in the discussion session. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so Ali. Um, bye.